The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. I'm really just excited to uh, give a talk here with Carrie Jones, who I met about two years ago. And I'll talk a little bit more about our relationship later, but <clears throat> as you all know, we use a lot of non-opioids um, in multimodal therapy, including one medication, Cymbalta or Duloxetine. And it works great for my patients. You know, I, I have, you know, the number needed to treat for Cymbalta is, you know, four to five. So four to five of my patients who, who need it are, are all on it. So I have several that are, that have just made their world and, and their lives so much better. And Terry uh, uh, Jones is the person who, brought uh, Cymbalta to market. Um, so we're super lucky to have her at Vanderbilt and, and uh, it was uh, really fortuitous to, to meet her. And uh, I have more faith in Cymbalta than she does, it seems. Uh, we talk about that, that often. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, drug discovery. We're gonna talk a little bit about multimodal therapy, but we're gonna focus more on opioids. They seem to be one of our best tools. So if I can advance the slide seems to be frozen. There we go. First of all, all um, we're both uh, funded by Ancora, which is an internal collaboration, and Dr. Jones will talk a little bit more about that, um, Vanderbilt um, funded uh, organization. So it's within Vanderbilt funding here. Learning objectives will be, I'm going to give a background quickly on pain mechanisms and addiction me mechanisms, just very uh, a high level overview. Um, so we have some foundation for the basic science uh, presentation as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about the limits for opioids. We all know them. Um, we're all, you know, cognizant every single day in every case about the potential um, adverse effects of opioids. And um, then Carrie's going to go through some of the phases of drug discovery. And we're going to introduce you to a, the muscarinic receptor, the M5. Um, M5 is a nice car. Um, it's also a nice receptor, and uh, we're going to we're going to uh, burn that word into and burn that term into your memory because it's a, it'll be a real relevant drug target in the future. And we're going to conceptualize together. I think you're going to get the you're going to get the picture as we go through this, and you're going to see the implications of the science that Carrie's working on. Um, and you, like me, will have many aha moments in here and have many ideas. And we as an academic anesthesia department, um, that's what we're about, is these great ideas and collaborating to bring um, good ideas to, to our patients. So I'm going to take 10 minutes, then Carrie's going to take another 20 minutes, and I'm going to wrap it up with the, with the, with the designs. But I want to briefly just step back and take a deep breath. It's 630 in the morning. Um, anesthesiologists, I told Carrie, we, we do our presentations early. I know she's up at this time because we're always texting back and forth at this time anyway. But this is your life, right, as an anesthesiologist. And a few years back, as a new attending, I just, you know, realized that how little I actually knew despite having gone through, what, 15 years of training and how much I relied on you and all the other specialists in anesthesia around me, even day to day, and I still do. And so, you know, I don't have many firsts, but I have the first publication of a song um, in anesthesiology, and you can snapshot this QR code and listen to it later. Don't do it now because it'll pop up the music. Um, but this is really a song about you and everything you do every day and changing chaos to beautiful things in the same place. Um, in obstetrics and pediatrics, the patients that we know, the people, the anesthesiologists we know. And, you know, we, we know that driving anesthesia forward is, is a lot of incremental safety steps and a lot of incremental studies, but we also tackle the big things. And safety in the last 20 decades or last two decades, 20 years, has been really led by anesthesiology. And if we aren't going to tackle the opioid crisis and the opioid-related things, then who is? I think anesthesiologists should be driving this. 
So let's just take a step back 10 years in your careers and your, in your training and, and go back to the basic science again. Here is a nerve track, one line nerve track, little chalk talk here. And that is the spinal cord. And when you feel pain out there in your hand, the pain gets transmitted along the arm of the nerve to the body of the nerve, which lives in the dorsal root ganglion and transmits um, to the, in, in this case, lamina two of the dorsal spinal cord. A second order neuron then travels to the brain um, after it decussates in the spinal cord and crosses over at a, over a, a, a uh, about two levels in the spinal cord. It ends in the thalamus where it signals to third order neurons. And those third order neurons um, go many different places. Some of the places that they, they, they go are to the sensory cortex and that's where we feel pain. But they go elsewhere too. The, the brain needs to modulate that signal somehow. And one way it does it is as projections to the anterior part of the brain, anterior limbic structures, um, prefrontal cortex, areas where the where also the emotional centers of the brain are and the contextual centers of the brain are and learning areas so all these areas are impacted in the brain and can modulate pain in that way by sending signals back down but it also will definitely influence other things that we'll talk about so if we zoom up on that synapse this is some this is a structure Work that we think about every single day in the operating room as we're giving medications, and this is the target of many of those medications, at this synaptic structure in lamina two, there are many different uh, receptors. The, the presynaptic calcium receptors, which are responsible for the release of the neurotransmitters as they cross, the postsynaptic NMDA receptors, where our ketamine acts, and glutamate as a neurotransmitter. Then there are the GABAergic interneurons, and those help to modulate the signal of pain, and they're, they're chloride channels. Then we have these descending modulating tracks from the brain coming down, and those release serotonin and norepinephrine, and that's where our serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, our tricyclic antidepressants, our, our um, SNRIs, our SSRIs all work to kind of keep the concentration of those, of those neurotransmitters high and help to filter the, the signals of pain before they get to the brain and dampen that signal. There are also a lot of what we call um, seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptors. On the presynaptic terminals, they're highly concentrated alpha twos. That's where guanfacine and clonidine and tizanidine all target. There are cannabinoid receptors, highly concentrated CB1 receptors in the, in the central nervous system, but, but then there are mu opioid receptors. They're also G protein coupled receptors and they're everywhere. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about not those. There's a, there's a receptor in this system that we're not talking about yet, but I wanna talk a little bit about what happens when we target these other receptors first. So yes, we use, look at all these medicines that we use to target those other receptors for the transmission of pain. And they all do certain things. We know what they do and we know their limitations. We can't get through an operation without something strong, especially if it's a major trauma operation like um, traumatic injury or, or and, you know, without some, some potent analgesic like ketamine in many cases. Um, you wouldn't probably take someone through a major surgery without a strong and potent analgesic like ketamine. And we can do some of those major surgeries without an opioid, no doubt. Um, but you couldn't really do it with duloxetine. You couldn't really take someone through surgery just on nortriptyline. Um, and so we obviously know what the limitations are with those medicines. They help, but they're insufficient. Now, opioids. So... Obviously, um, opioids are potent, and you can go up and up and up, and as you go up and up and up, you reach the risks, and they start to outweigh the benefits. And, and some of the benefits are obviously pain control. Outside of local anesthetics and ketamine in, a sh in short periods of time intraoperatively and not outpatient, especially in the chronic pain realm, there's nothing yet that can 
that can treat pain like an opioid. And that can be looked at two ways, right? That could be looked at positively or negatively. And I think that the negative side of things are, look at these long-term side effects of opioids. Poor memory, poor concentration, mood changes, psychological disturbances, abdominal pain, hormonal changes. And then what we really are scared of is respiratory depression, sedation, constipation, nausea, and addiction. And you're probably familiar with the advertisements on TV that, that um, advertise all the things you can take with an opioid to make it safer, especially so you don't get constipated. Um, they advertise those things during the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, using naloxone to counter respiratory depression outpatient. But there's not a lot on prevention of addiction if you're going to use opioids. And so if we look back here and we look at that anterior limb of this third order um, uh, pathways, projection to the limbic system, what happens when you take an opioid? Well, Obviously, people take an opioid for to relieve their pain, and relieve their relieving your pain is is rewarding in and of itself. You can feel uh, your endocannabinoids will go up, your endogenous opioids will go up when pain is relieved. But when you give exogenous opioids, you you directly activate um, these reward circuitry. I'm just going to talk about this very briefly because Carrie's going to dive, Dr. Jones is going to dive really deep into this. So. There's this cycle, the addiction and reward cycle and circuitry, where when a person takes an opioid, they feel they can feel warm. Some about 10% of people will feel really warm. It really gives them energy. Um, about 80% of people will feel pain relief and not necessarily um, a, a, a super overwhelming desire to use for a long period of time. And about 10% of people will just get nauseated and hate the stuff. And that's, that's a under, probably an underlying um, component of our genetics. But by activating these basal ganglia, prefrontal cortex, um, amygdala, which is responsible for a lot of our emotional responses, there's a certain circuitry in there, which Carrie will dive into, that results in the release of dopamine. And obviously dopamine is the rewarding signal in our brain and a reinforcing signal that tells us we should do it again um, when we have a lot of sugar, we should do it again. That's, that's a survival mechanism for us. But sometimes it, the, the changes in those, in those synaptic systems, um, work against us. Now, a couple slides on where we are with the most up-to-date evidence we have, um, of the opioid epidemic. On the far right here, we have, oh, this is a graph of, of the number of overdose deaths in 2019, the most recent data that we have. And we had a record year, unfortunately. And super unfortunately, we've been at this now and recognize that this epidemic was going on for since 1999. And that, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in local, regional, and billions and billions of dollars have been poured into this and we had a record year of substance use disorder and overdoses last year. That is very, very sad. But that's the top, that's the top line. 50,000 of those overdoses were related to opioids. If you look down a little bit lower, um, I think it's the blue line. You know, it's the, it's the um, kind of brown, brown line is synth synthetic. So the synthetic opioids are things like fentanyl and sufentanyl, and that's the illicit market um, opioids. And then much lower, the semi-synthetic and natural opioids like morphine and oxycodone. Um, Semi-synthetics, let's see, that's the, the green line. You can see that's slightly decreasing. So we're doing our job, we think, but why isn't it decreasing faster? Why are we still kind of hovering that way, almost the same, way levels we were in 2015. Well, what are we doing? We are, we are still treating people in our world and we are still treating people with opioids. We don't have anything better. And look at this. This is just a couple of years older data. 
for 40,000 people who died of an overdose death, there were 2, 000, 2 million people, and this is a, believe me, an under recognition and under um, uh, solicitation of the number of people with opioid use disorder and addiction. And then there were 11 million people that misused opioids for 19 million people with high impact chronic pain living in America. 50 million people with living with chronic pain. So this is the iceberg under the surface. And think about every year, the trauma, the surgeries, about 10% of people with surgeries end up having chronic pain at 12 months. And many, many of those are still on opioids and we're still doing surgery. So this isn't going away. This underlying pool of people on who are tolerant to opioids is not going away. Look at this. Of all these surgeries, I took a bunch of different papers and references and looked at the incidence of chronic pain and opioid use. And it, it's ranging somewhere around eight to 10, 10% after 30 days or after 100 days. And at one year, it's, it's still similar in many of these surgeries. Thoracic, look at the incidence of chronic post-surgical pain and thoracic surgery, 60% at one year. And those patients end up in our, and they fill our clinics. You know, 50% of every patient having a thoracic, major thoracic surgery at Vanderbilt is ending up in a pain clinic, usually. Same thing with lumbar spine fusion. One of the tools that we have to treat, um, to treat uh, pain and addiction, as you know, is buprenorphine. This is the, one of the main treatments. Um, there are two formulations that we use for opioid use disorder. Um, Suboxone and Subutex, and these have primarily buprenorphine in them as the active agent. Now, I'm making a slight um, transition here towards the addiction uh, treatment of addiction here. This is our main medication that we use for the treatment of addiction. There are limitations for methadone and naltrexone, but buprenorphine is the main one. Um, but still, you know, there are limitations for this. Look at the barriers. It, it dampens the effects of other opioids. We're familiar with that, right? When a patient comes in on buprenorphine, it's a partial agonist. It's gonna partially block the opioids that we're gonna be using to treat major surgical pain. But like every other opioid, buprenorphine also activates the mu opioid receptor and causes all those long-term consequences that we just talked about. You know, the changes in mood, um, the the dependence, the tolerance, it does the same, even though it stabilizes people's minds and allows them to work. So it's a great drug. Look at this, this is a good take home slide for everyone. Um, KI is your equilibrium dissociation constant. What makes buprenorphine so effective is that it's kind of a weak agonist, but it's, it doesn't want to leave that mu opioid receptor. It sticks in there and it stays in there and it blocks the activation of that, that receptor by other opioids. The KI for buprenorphine is 0.21. That's really, really a high affinity for that receptor. The only thing that outcompetes that is sufentanil, and we occasionally use that. The other thing that comes close is hydromorphone, 0.36. So when we're thinking about medications and opioids to, to use when someone's on buprenorphine, we need to think about those medications that are closest to buprenorphine and their affinity for the receptor if we have any chance of giving the patient pain relief. So as we transition here over to Dr. Jones's presentation, let's consider the gaps in care in pain management. There's no analgesic potent enough to treat moderate to severe pain outside of opioids in awake patients. We have, we have to live with the current opioid risks. So wouldn't it be nice if we had all the benefits of an opioid and without the risks? That would be great. Um, opioid drug development currently has been focusing on mitigating other things like constipation and respiratory depression. Op opioid overdose and addiction are driven by prolonged use of opioids, high doses for long periods of time. And that is, I'm telling you, that's so common in the chronic pain world and especially after surgery, that's what we do every single day. And it doesn't seem we're, like we're able to get out of this, this situation. The gaps in unmet needs in addiction treatment are that, 
you know, a lot of people don't want to be on medicines. It's like they're trading one medicine for another. They're getting all the long-term um, uh, side effects of medications like buprenorphine and, and they would love to not be on medicines. Um, so there's a stigma there too. Um, it's difficult to manage pain when a person is on naltrexone depot that lasts 30 days or buprenorphine that has a half-life of 24 hours. Um, patients coming in for surgery are sometimes hard to treat when they're on buprenorphine. About 10% of people still have cravings and still seek out um, heroin when they're on buprenorphine treatment. So we're failing them there. And the relapse rate is really high, up to 80% in people after their treatment with buprenorphine after 30 days. So that means that many people have to be on buprenorphine for the rest of their lives. So I met Carrie about two years ago over dinner um, when we were gathering as a group and she and I started to talk. And she, she asked me a question as we delved into what each other does um, for a living. And she said, if I had a compound that could, that could prevent um, the reward or the addiction to an opioid um, when, a, when a person, when it, would you have any patients that would benefit from something like that? I just, I think I took too long to respond because I was trying to think of a patient that I had that was on opioids that wouldn't respond. And I just, my only response was all of them. All of them would benefit. Every patient um, who I was going to give an opioid for, I would want them to not have that um, the high or the reward that would drive them to want to um, use it and become addicted to it. Um, and perhaps that would help them control their pain without the, without the um, risks of, of long-term um, uh, uh, downsides. So I'm going to switch this over now to Carrie and we're going to dive right into the data. Go ahead and unmute yourself and, and take your time, Carrie. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see the screen. Uh, good morning. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, to talk with you along with Dr. Edwards. Um, I thought what I would do by way of overview first is to tell you a little bit about the stages of drug discovery and development for small molecule CNS drugs. When we talk about developing new drugs for different CNS applications, for example, uh, for the treatment of chron acute or chronic pain, uh, we, we split that process, that timeline, into two key phases. In the first approximately six to seven years, we talk about the discovery phase. And during this phase, we're identifying new targets. Uh, today, I'll tell you about a new early stage program to identify and, and validate a new GPCR target. Past identifying new targets and validating them, we identify early chemical leads. Uh, we characterize those chemical compounds and try to optimize them for drug-like properties to the point where we're able to get to a preclinical candidate compound uh, during a very intense selection process that we can then put into what we call an investigational new that, that we can then put into extensive toxicology studies. And if we see that in preclinical species, uh, both rodents and higher order animal species, that the compound is safe and well tolerated. We will put all this data into what's called an IND, an investigational new drug uh, application to the FDA, to ask permission to proceed to first in human studies. If the compound in animals is deemed to have sufficient therapeutic index, we proceed from the discovery phase into approximately a seven year development phase. And in that development phase, we first start by evaluating our new investigational drug product in what is called phase one. And this is looking at the safety and tolerability of our drug product in healthy volunteers. 
if the compound is deemed to be safe and well tolerated, we next move into phase two. And in phase two, we're going to evaluate our compound in patients with the particular primary indication. So for today, for example, that might be a new drug for chronic pain. Um, and it's, this is an initial proof of concept. So in a phase two, we're only going to be evaluating our new potential drug in anywhere from, from 100 to 500 patients. If we have success in phase two, we move next to phase three. And the critical component of a phase three clinical study is that we're, again, going to be evaluating our compound within patients with the primary indication, for this example, chronic pain. But we're now going to look at a very broad range of patients, so anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 patients, so that we're really looking at a much broader heterogeneous population to understand uh, how, how efficacious this new treatment might be. At the end of that development process, all of the data from the discovery and the development periods are put into a new drug, uh, new drug application to the FDA uh, for full FDA approval. The FDA can take up to two years to approve at, uh, to review this application and to approve it. And at that point, if approved, it now goes on the market and is available for, for all of you as clinicians to use. I think the two big take-homes are this, um, and they're, they're really at the bottom. Currently, the average cost of the way small molecule CNS drugs are developed in major pharmaceutical companies is in the multi-millions to billions. And the, and the average time period is 10 to 15 years. And so I think we can all agree that that approach is too expensive and too long. So increasingly over the last five or six years, almost the last decade, a, a number of us who had been in industry uh, and, and enjoying our work in industry have migrated to academic institutions to develop academic drug discovery teams and have developed a, a new role in academia for drug discovery and development. And in this new role, we identify new targets um, that, and, and uh, establish assays and reagents to validate those targets. We actually do high throughput screens in cell lines to identify novel compounds. Um, we get to lead identification. Lead means uh, a lead compound. Um, and we get these compounds to do initial proof of concept studies. Sometimes those studies are in cell-based assays. Often they are early stage studies in animal models of our particular indication. We then, in our academic drug discovery teams, optimize these compounds, these lead but, compounds. Right, so Freddie comes to me and says. For, for drug-like properties and, and in, in lead optimization. Um, and then at that point, usually, we will, we will be de-risking the these chemical assets to partner with major pharmaceutical companies. And then, and then coming back to academia, importantly, um, as all of you are aware, for uh, the clinical work, for the proof of concept hypothesis testing in your clinical populations, as well as potentially developing biomarkers and assessing different modes of target engagement for our particular drug. Taken together, this new role for academic drug discovery teams around the country, including the one that I've been fortunate to be a part of, is to de-risk innovative new approaches for the treatment of various CNS disorders in order to facilitate full drug discovery and development in partnership with industry, and to do this with smaller, smaller budgets and in shorter timelines. And so for about the last 14 years, I have been one of the founding members of what was formerly the Vanderbilt Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. It's just been newly endowed by the, Warren, uh, by the William Warren Foundation and is now known as the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. As many of you know, our executive director is Dr. Jeff Kahn, and Dr. Craig Lindsley is the co-director and also the director of medicinal chemistry. And there are really three overreaching goals for, for the Warren Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery. First, to develop small molecule ligands for early proof of concept studies to further therapeutic development for various indications. The other thing that I think is really important for me in this process is the development 
number two, of key reagents that we provide to the scientific community. So as we're optimizing novel compounds, some of these compounds will have high levels of intellectual property that will be good for partnering with major pharma. But many of these compounds will not have suitable properties to proceed into further development but they make excellent tool compounds to deeply understand the biology that we're looking at. When I was in major pharma, those compounds that fell off the, the discovery pipeline were put on a shelf and, they, and the larger scientific communities did not get access to them. And that's really a difference with academic drug discovery because in real time, as a compound is deemed not suitable to continue to progress in the discovery process, we make that available as a key scientific tool reagent to people all over the country and world to further understand the biology that we that we that we may be focused on or other or other biology for other indications and finally the the, the goal another goal of the center is to develop small, a small number of high priority programs uh, to discover clinical development candidates for licensing opportunities with major pharmaceutical partners. So as you look at this timeline from discovery to development that I have here on this slide, we really spend most of our time in the green area. But we have more recently actually ventured without partnership from pharmaceutical company from preclinical development into phase one. And this was through a generous donation from the William Warren Foundation for the money to do the IND enabling toxicology studies for a new or a new drug treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And then we were able to proceed that into phase one here at Vanderbilt. And many of you may have, have heard about this. Um, this is the, we've advanced a selected M1 positive allosteric modulator known as VU319 into clinical development for the cognitive impairments associated with Alzheimer's disease. And this was through a highly productive collaboration with Dr. Paul Newhouse, who is director of the Vanderbilt Center for Cognitive Medicine within the Department of Psychiatry. This collaboration was built over the course of a five-year period of time and has now led to a clinical asset that just in this last six months was partnered by Acadia Pharmaceuticals for further development. So very exciting and, and I have uh, great hopes that we'll be able to do something similar in my collaboration with Dr. Edwards for potentially developing uh, different drug treatments to make opioids safer for your clinical practice. Let's talk a little bit about that. And this is the CME code. It's in the chat too, so go ahead. Okay. So when we think about developing treatments for opioid addiction, we need to talk about the stages of the human addiction cycle. And those really start with, in the case of prescription opioids, a prescription of an opioid for the treatment of a medical condition. And then a subset of your patients that leads to drug abuse, followed by periods of abstinence, but in all cases, uh, relapse back to drug-seeking behavior. One of the things that's powerful about trying to develop treatments for opioid drug addiction is that we can use animal models to model these different stages of the addiction cycle. And one of the models that I'll talk to you about today is called drug self-administration in animals. Animals are implanted. Um, in, in the, on the left-hand side, you're seeing an anim, a rat, but we can also do this in non-human primates. You can implant them with jugular can, uh, catheters, and now they can lever press to get IV infusions of opioids. An important take home for this model, if a human will abuse the substance, whether it's opioids, uh, uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, animals will self-administer it. So just, it's a very strong model for assessing the rewarding effects of substances of abuse. And armed with this model, we can actually look at the acquisition and the, and the early escalation phases of the human drug abuse cycle in our animals. We can place animals into forced abstinence or we can extinguish drug seeking behavior. And then we can actually look at the potential for reinstatement of drug seeking or relapse by inducing, it, by inducing drug seeking or uh, in this case, I'm gonna show you today, opioid self-administration behaviors with drug priming cues and other contexts that were first a part of their early association with the drugs, with the uh, learning the opioid self-administration. When we talk about where opioids are having their effects, 
it's important to note that, that as David said, that we believe that this is that for the reinforcing effects of most drugs of use, including opioid, it's mediated by the mesolimbic dopamine circuit. And this is dopamine neurons within the ventral tegmental area of the brain that project to the nucleus accumbens of the striatum. The mesolimbic dopamine pathway, also known as the canonical reward pathway. And in the case of opioids with, with your patients, when, when a patient takes opioids, those opioids bind to the new opioid receptor on GABAergic interneurons that normally inhibit this reward pathway. Um, but with the, opioid, uh, with, with the opioids in place, they actually have a mechanism by disinhibiting this GABAergic inhibitory gate on this reward pathway. So they're disinhibiting the reward pathway. And we, we got interested in the question, could we identify a target that was expressed somewhere on this circuitry that we could modulate, potentially block, that would block this hijacking of the opioids disinhibition of this reward circuit? And I'm going to tell you about one of these such targets. And this is the M5 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. A little more about this receptor. So the, the M5 muscarinic receptor is a G-protein coupled receptor. It's part of a family of five um, different subtypes, M1, M3, M5, coupled to GQ, and they increase phospholipase B, calcium mobilization, and MAP kinase. Um, in the case of M2 and M4, these subtypes coupled to GIGO and lead to decreases in adenyl cyclase and increases in MAP kinase signaling pathways, as well as increases in potassium channels. Um, M1 and M4 have the highest expression in cortical limbic regions known to be dysregulated in many neuropsychiatric disorders, including addiction. Most of you are familiar with M2 because it has high levels of expression within the cardiovascular and the respiratory systems. And in the case of M3, it's expressed in every major secretory gland in the body. Activate it non-selectively and you lacrimate, salivate, urinate, and defecate your way out of a clinical trial. And trust me, when we were at Lilly, we did. Um, so the last of these subtypes is the M5 muscarinic receptor subtype. Interestingly, to date, what we know about it has little to no expression in the peripheral, uh, in, in the peripheral uh, systems, but it, and also very low expression in the CNS, but it is highly enriched within the VTA, within that reward circuit. So we began to speculate that if we could block that receptor, which is known to be highly expressed on dopamine cells of the reward pathway, that we might actually block the, ex the output of the reward circuit uh, that gets disinhibited when you take opioids. Let me give you one piece of knockout data. This is showing, showing that there is de decreased sensitivity to opioids when you knock out the M5 receptor. Um, and here what you're looking at is the uh, M5 knockout mice, and they, they exhibit a reduced morphine place preference. So this is, we train animals to, in, in a two-chamber paradigm. They're either injected with vehicle to prefer chamber A, or they're dosed with morphine, and they're trained to, to prefer chamber B on morphine. And what you can see is that animals, the wild-type animals, definitely prefer spending time in the morphine-paired chamber that they were conditioned to. But when you knock out the M5 muscarinic receptor, you reduce that condition place preference uh, for, for that morphine uh, chamber, mor morphine pair chamber. Um, it's interesting because in this same paper, they showed that the M5 knockout animals, while there was a decreased sensitivity to the rewarding effects of opioids, there was no effect on the morphine-induced analgesia. And this is really where the field start, stopped for a while because of difficulties to develop subtype selective compounds to just M5 relative to the other four muscarinic receptors. Why is that? Well, this is looking at a representative uh, example of an M5 uh, G protein coupled receptor within the membrane. Um, and important for trying to develop selective compounds for just M5 over the other muscarinic receptors, um, whether it's an uh, the problem was is that we were always targeting previously the binding site for the endogenous neurotransmitter acetylcholine. By definition, that binding site on the receptor is known as the orthosteric binding site. And historically, targeting that binding site to develop subtype selective compounds has been difficult because that binding site for acetylcholine is highly conserved across the five muscarinic receptor subtypes. More recently, 
our team and others around the country have identified compounds that, that act and bind at less highly conserved regions of the receptor, not at the orthosteric binding site. And so by definition, these sites are known as allosteric sites. And we've gone from compounds that may have tenfold selectivity at the M5 uh, muscarinic receptor to compounds that have 100 to 1,000 fold selectivity by targeting compounds that are acting at these allosteric sites. I want to talk to you today about early preliminary data with two of these compounds. Um, we call these compounds if they bind and they antagonize the receptor. You guys are used to thinking about orthosteric antagonists, muscarinic antagonists. A good example in your practices are it would be scopolamine. But here I'm going to talk to you about negative allosteric modulators. And this is a compound that binds at an allosteric site, but still blocks the activity of the M5 receptor. And the two tool compounds I'll timing, talk to you. Just for timing, Carrie, we have 10 minutes left. Okay. okay, so I'm going to talk to you about um, ML375 and ML667. And these are our first two tool compounds. When we talk about assessing um, methods for opioid schedules of reinforcement, we put animals into operant boxes and they have a choice to lever press for an inactive lever or an active lever that's drug paired with an opioid. Today, this will be with male spray dolly rats. Um, and we will be pairing this lever um, with oxycodone. Um, importantly, the, the particular paradigm that you're going to see today is that with each lever press, we're going to do a progressive ratio. So they're going to lever press once and get an infusion of opioid. We're now, they're now going to lever press three times to get opioid and we have to make them work. They have to successively press increasing more times on the lever to get that infusion of opioid. And this allows us to look at the, ch the change in breakpoint. How much time will the animals work or lever press um, to perform to get that reinforcer, in this case, the opioid um, oxycodone. And so this is looking at some of our initial data. And here you're looking at the breakpoint. And what we're trying to do is decrease this breakpoint for our animals to self-administer oxycodone. And we can see in our control group in the, the, in the, in the blue curve that, that we see that there is with increasing doses of oxycodone, we see a dose dependent increase in oxycodone self-administration. But if we pre-treat our animals with either a dose of 10 or 30 milligram per kilogram of our M5 negative allosteric modulator, we can attenuate at 10 and fully block the oxycodone self-administration in our rats. And this is actually more efficacious than a, the dose, uh, than a fully efficacious dose of the non-selective opioid naltrexone um, seen here in the open circles. Important to this data, showing that we're blocking the rewarding effects of oxycodone self-administration. This is at a dose that does not affect food maintained behaviors and it is not because we are sedating the animals. But what about, can we have an effect on relapse behaviors? So if we train animals to lever press for oxycodone, and now we're going to train that every, every three lever presses, they're going to get an infusion of oxycodone. And every time they get oxycodone, there's going to be a cue light on. So they're going to learn to associate that cue light, that environmental cue, with getting the IV administration of the opioid. We're then going to get them stable re-responded, and then we're going to place them into a forced abstinence, similar in your patient populations to an addict running out of the opioid or being put into incarceration or into a rehab program. And then we're gonna come back 48 hours later. We're gonna place them in the operant chambers, but now we're only gonna give them the cubolite. They're not gonna be able to lever press and get opioid. They're just gonna have the cubolite. And can the cubolite itself cause, can that inspire, the, uh, motivate them, excuse me, to lever press on that, pre, on that lever that previously gave them opioid. Um, and in fact, that's what we see in this data. And so what you're looking at is lever pressing, the animals in the chamber, and, the, and there's a cue light that's on, and they're lever pressing this cue light. They're no longer getting oxycodone. And what we see is that the animals, just with that cue, will have very high levels of responding. They've learned to associate that light with, with getting an infusion of an opioid. Um, however, if we pretreat the animals with either 10 or 30 of our M5 NAM, we can attenuate that oxycodone associated Q responding. Um, and that's very exciting to this because this is, if you will, a Q reactivity model of abstinence um, that we think we'd see in your patient populations, suggesting that this mechanism might also be beneficial for relapse behaviors.
Um, and so finally, we've talked about the ascending pathway for processing of pain. And the question is, but do the M5 MAMs have effects on pain? And so we looked in two models of nociception. Many of you may be fam familiar with a supraspinal mediated model, the hot plate. Animals are placed on a, a plate that's heated to 55 degrees, and we're looking at their responsiveness to that hot plate. Or animals are placed with their tails on an infrared photo beam, 55 degrees, and we're looking at their response to that thermal stimulus. And what we see is we're looking at the maximum possible effect, um, the amount of analgesic-like effect in this assay, and we see that our compounds when dosed alone at either 30 or, 30 or 56.6 milligram, they have no effect. When we give oxycodone alone now, sub-Q, at increasing doses, we see a very nice dose-dependent increase in anti-nociceptive activity. Um, and this is consistent with what's been published in the literature that oxycodone shows very good dose-dependent analgesic effects. But when we give our compounds in combination, either at each of these doses, a dose of 30 mg per kg of our M5-NAM or a dose of 56 of mg per kg of our M5-NAM, these are the two curves that are either in the pink triangles or the red squares, we see no shift in that oxycodone-induced antinociceptive or analgesic curve, suggesting that at the doses where we're seeing the blockade of the rewarding effects of opioids, we are not impacting oxycodone-induced analgesia. And at this point, David, do I need to stop and let you go forward, or should I show the next slide? You're on mute. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. One minute on the next slide. It's an important one. Good. So everything I've shown you is acute. But what if we gave our compound daily, every day before we, we started to train animals to acquire oxycodone self-administration? And this is the data that you're seeing here. So in this paradigm, every time they press the lever, they're going to get an infusion of oxycodone. Um, and in the blue circles, what you're seeing is animals, they were drug naive starting out on day one. And over the course of 21 days, they learn to acquire oxycodone self-administration. They become addicted to oxycodone in this paradigm. In the, the red triangles, we actually give a, one of our M5 NAMs every day daily before we train. So every single day, they're administered our, our M5 blockade prior to training. And what you see is over the course of 21 days, we are able to significantly attenuate the acquisition of oxycodone self-administration, suggesting that we might be able to combine this treatment with opioids to mitigate the risk for the induction of addictive properties in your patient populations. And I, I'll stop there. Okay, so I'll share my screen if you want to share yours. Yep. Now we're going to finish up just with two more slides um, to show our clinical trial designs and you'll see you'll see and hear more about this in in the years to come as we present um, our results but there are two designs one is for relapse prevention um, in patients who um, are already ad addicted to opioids and these patients we see in our bridge clinic um, they have overdosed and ended up in at Vanderbilt in the hospital and they're randomized to our bridge clinic or to usual care. The other clinical design trial that we're gonna run is addiction prevention um, during surgery. So providing patients with the M5 NAM before their surgery and for the entire duration of the exposure to opioids and looking at them long-term. So the first prevention trial is a phase four trial, four months, or phase two trial for four months. It's effectiveness and safety trial randomized double blind with the MNAM versus placebo. Um, our primary uh, objective is to see the reduction in opioid use through urine drug screens, um, their, the rate of relapse going down basically. Three groups in that case. Our primary outcome is opioid use measured by urine drug screens. So after patients um, arrive in our clinic for a week, we'll get them on buprenorphine We'll start their treatment and in one of the groups they will be on buprenorphine and placebo, a second group buprenorphine 
plus the M5, and then a control group with placebo and M5. And what we're hoping to see is that patients have reduced cravings. And during the maintenance phase, we'll measure, continue to measure cravings. But the important phase is when you discontinue this, the treatment of buprenorphine, um, we want to make that a successful period for our patients when 80% of them relapse. But we think with the M5 on board, their cravings and their, their drug-seeking behaviors will, will be much reduced and our successful um, abstinence period will, will be improved. We don't have anything in the market at this point for this period in these patients. And lastly, addiction prevention and surgery, um, which I hope all of you will be a part of and helping us make this uh, a really good trial. Phase two trial efficacy and safety as well. Um, and what we want is similar to Jen Jennifer Haw's gabapentin trial, which she presented last year in Grand Rounds, where um, you've exposed um, patients in that, in that sense to gabapentin perioperatively, and their cessation of opioids after surgery was increased by 25%. Well, what if we could prevent any of the rewarding signals to the opioids and just use them for analgesia during surgery? Um, would, they, would patients come off of their opioids faster? Would they be less likely to seek um, opioids at six months in one year? Well, that, those are the questions we'll be asking. So in summary, we, very simply, opioids are effective at treating pain. Opioid side effect of reward is responsible for addiction. M5s prevent uh, reward and addiction to opioids in animals. Phase two trials to show efficacy of M5 to prevent reward and addiction in humans. So potentially every opioid that we prescribe at any time would be, would be combined with an M5 to prevent any kind of addiction, addiction development. I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people um, on Carrie's team um, who helped to bring this um, so, so far. We're gonna look really quickly at questions here. Everyone's gonna be running to the operating room, so I'm gonna read some questions here. Dr. Blair says, Dr. Jones, are there specific brainstem M1 receptors that VU3119 targets preferentially? Uh, there are not. That's for okay. the M1 muscarinic receptor program. And um, the predominant expression of the M1 muscarinic receptor is primarily in the cortical and limbic regions. And then Dr. Gupta asks us, will the M5 be continued into the discontinuation period? And even though we flew over that in less than 30 seconds, I think that is the exciting point. Um, we really don't know how long a person um, needs to be on buprenorphine treatment or if they even need to be on it if they're on an M5. But we do know um, or, or for their brains to completely recover or for, for them to be out of risk of relapse. Um, but um, at this point, um, the, in the animal studies, the co-delivery um, of M5 with the opioid has been sufficient. And so we're looking at uh, pharmacokinetics right now to make sure that our M5 levels are um, blocking the level of opioid that each animal is getting. And if that's sufficient, how long does that last? So those are those are studies being designed in animals. Kira, if you want to comment. Yeah, and I'll just say about what you're hearing today, this is early, this is the very beginning of what will be a longer discovery and development process. So you heard a lot about early stage tool compounds that would have to be optimized further for David to be able to use in these very innovative phase two clinical studies that he's been talking to you about. But it's great for us to begin to talk with you, all of you as a department about your ideas for the future applications of more optimized M5 names. All right, if uh, there are no further questions, I think we will wrap up uh, today's grand round. So thank you, Dr. Jones and Dr. Edwards for uh, your outstanding presentation. And we look forward to hearing more about your discoveries in the near future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.